It is the member of Parliament for Senate Gulf Islands since May 4th. I've been in Parliament now for, we've only had a session that lasted from June 2nd till June 27th. And in that time, you know, when we know the first session of Parliament, I thought, well, I know I can do more than the pundits say I can do, because after all, the pundits were very sure that I wasn't going to get elected. They were a very reliable group of people for wrong information. So I wasn't supposed to get elected. Then they very quickly regrouped and said, well, she's not going to, you know, she's, okay, so she got elected. But they didn't admit that was a surprise. They went right to the next observed wisdom, which was, well, we'll never hear from her again because it's not a big deal to have one Green MP because she won't get to ask questions in question period. I remember hearing, I really love Katie O'Malley, so don't let this sound like a slur on Katie O'Malley, but Katie O'Malley was being interviewed by Kathleen Petty on the House right after the election. And of course, in typical, the, the new version of CBC is they don't interview anyone who actually knows what they're talking about. The goal is to have CBC people interview each other. <laughs> standing up. Yeah, so, I mean, Peter Management wants to know what's going on with the markets. He interviews Amanda. He said, Amanda, what's going on with the market? She's like, huh, Peter? Boy, the markets. So, in this particular interview, Katie O'Malley, who is really quite a good source of information about how parliamentary procedure works, was being interviewed by Kathleen Petty on the House. Is well, you know, Elizabeth Mason, the MP, are we ever going to, what's that mean? Well, well basically nothing. <laughs> because we'll never hear from her in question period and she won't get to be on committees and you know and so on. the reality of the House of Commons and the same for Queen's Park, we live in a constitutional monarchy with a Westminster parliamentary democracy. This is not, underscored not, a presidential system. This is not all about the leaders at all. In fact, I, I really like the reform of the leaders debates that have been proposed by Tom Axworthy and the Institute for Democracy at Queen's University because they talk about the importance of having other people other than the party leadership get involved in debates because at least in theory and in principle and in tradition, the Westminster parliamentary system and the House of Commons in Ottawa is equal members of parliament. Members of parliament are considered equals. The prime minister has traditionally been considered first among equals. As a result of that particular formula of how our parliament and our government works, every member of parliament has rights. Every member of parliament can stand up every single day uh, to deliver petitions, such as the one I'm gonna deliver on shark fin soup, which got a lot of attention recently. Uh, petitions, on, petitions against the omnibus crime bill, but not only can I do petitions, I have the right to introduce, oh, and any day, uh, several times a day, I can stand up at any point of order that needs to be made. And I can introduce amendments to every bill going through the, legis the Parliament of Canada at third reading. I will introduce amendments to shine a light on what's wrong with the omnibus crime bill, to point out how absolutely anti humanitarian and crazy the anti human smuggling bill is, to take on every single bill that goes to the House of Commons. I am now the only leader of any opposition party who is an interim, and I will be the effective official opposition for everyone with a heart in this country. So, in the last session of the House of Commons, I was the only member of Parliament to object to passing the Mega Trials Criminal Code amendments without any hearings, so I forced hearings. One MP, they said I wouldn't do anything. Well, gee, how is that? Well, it's because every MP has these powers. The reason they don't use them is that they belong to one of the other political parties. And in the other political parties, sadly, because a lot of them have great people in them, and a lot of the other parties have traditions that I respect, but the excessive power of partisanship, the absolute unholy clout of unelected spin doctors who sit in back rooms, means that once the election is over, these guys don't go away. They sit there and tell members of parliament how to vote. And they tell them what to say. And they analyze issues that come before the Parliament of Canada, not on the basis of how do we resolve this problem for Canadians, to meet the greatest good of the greatest number in the interest of the common good, 
No, every issue, and this is, I'm speaking of the liberals, the NDP and the conservatives, every issue that comes before them is analyzed by where's our advantage, where's our wedge issue, how do we play this well so that we get points out of this. And that's so wrong-headed and it's so anti-democratic and it actually is anathema to the very system of government we have of Westminster parliamentary democracy. We should be checking our partisanship at the door after the election and working together in the House of Commons to solve issues. And when I went into the House of Commons and found, I mean, I, I kind of knew a lot of this stuff because I've been working on the Hill. As I mentioned, I started working in 1986 as the senior policy advisor to the federal minister of environment. I know how parliament works. But hyper-partisanship has been growing and growing and growing. And the fact that when I went into the House and the numbers of time that in a three-week period, I was the only member of parliament on issue after issue who said no. I was the only member of parliament who voted no to continuing to bomb Libya. I'm sure by the time I get back to the house, everybody will be saying how great it was that we continued to bomb Libya because the rebels have won. But in my mind, I'll never know what would have happened if we'd accepted the peace solution that was being offered by the African Union, by South African President Zuma, who brought forward a compromise before our vote in June, about three weeks before our vote in June. They said, let's have a ceasefire, let's have peace talks, and stop the bombing. Gaddafi accepted that, and the rebels refused, and all the NATO allies refused. So how many people died because we didn't stop bombing? Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was right to keep bombing and get rid of Gaddafi. But it sure as hell had nothing to do with the original doctrine, which was the rationale for going to Libya, which was to protect civilian life under the responsibility to protect doctrine. We took the responsibility to protect doctrine, and we may have destroyed it forever by using it as a Trojan horse to go into Libya for the purpose of removing Gaddafi because Libya has oil. And we've ignored the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Over and over again, we've been asked by the United Nations. I don't know if you know this. In the last four years, three times that I know of, the United Nations has asked Canada to send three or four people to help the peacekeeping forces of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the United Nations peacekeeping, to end the systematic use of rape as a weapon of war. All the things in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Millions of people have been killed. We don't, go, we don't send three or four people General Andrew Leslie was willing to go, wanted to go. Harper said no. Can't afford three or four people because we're in Afghanistan. But in Libya, Stephen Harper says, we either are a country that cares, about, says we care about liberty or we're a country that cares about liberty. The hypocrisy is so galling. But one Green MP at least can stand there and say in the House of Commons, I can't vote with you on this. I want to protect civilian life in Libya. I want to see the end of Colonel Gaddafi. But I want to see Canada as a peacekeeping nation that goes to defend lives in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and it doesn't ignore Syria. Because in Syria we couldn't protect civilians. Because China and Russia in the United Nations said, wait a minute, you used the responsibility to protect doctrine to go into Libya and you didn't mean it. You just used it to go in there to get rid of Gaddafi. So you've destroyed the legitimacy of the doctrine. Well, that was just one of the votes. The filibuster on Canada Post, I tried so hard to get rid of the horrible anti-union backdoor legislation from the Harper government. But in one month, less than one month, in the House of Commons, I blocked unanimous consent. I mean, one MP can make a big difference. And when I hear Tim Grant speak about what he would do, when I think about what it would mean to focus on a junk food tax, of course, Tim's missed the big flaw in his argument, right? The flaw in the argument is to assume that Canadian governmental decision makers want to reduce childhood diabetes. Because the problem is that will really blow a hole in the profits of big pharma. They're looking forward to the surge and the rise of diabetes because they'll sell a whole lot more insulin drugs. And I'm not in this place, speaking to you from, a, from paranoia, there was a brilliant expose of this from the United States in an article called Let Them Eat Cake, which documented the ways in which Krispy Kreme donuts 
deliberately located themselves in Latino neighborhoods because they knew those families were too poor, poor to afford eggs and toast and orange juice for breakfast, but a Krispy Kreme donut would fill up their kids and last through the day. And those kids were getting rickets and the signs of diabetes and malnutrition before grade six. And the same article dovetailed into that. Articles from the pharmaceutical industry documenting how they saw the surge in profits coming because diabetes is on the increase. We have to take off the blinders about whose interests traditional parties in this country will serve. We have to look at what it means to have Health Canada approve drugs that do never stand the scrutiny in the light of day. Things like Vioxx, the independent drug assessors, like the Therapeutics Initiative at University of British Columbia, saw based on the documentation from the pharmaceutical industry itself. This drug will kill more people than it cures. But Health Canada is really not interested in doing anything other than serving what they see as their client group, which is the pharmaceutical industry. So we have to really go with these things and recognize there are entrenched interests that oppose the things that make sense. The things that make sense are fundamentally that we grow local food so people stay healthy and farmers can make an income. There are things like we should reduce greenhouse gases so we have a livable world so our kids aren't living in a version of Dante's Inferno that we are leaving for them. These things are so obvious and so sensible that you wonder sometimes, why are we so ineffective at getting these changes made? And there we have to take off our blinders. We're up against a very large very entrenched special interests that don't want us to succeed. And all the other parties, to one extent or another, are beholden to these interests. To one extent or another. And the one party that will always speak truth to power, the one party that will always tell the truth to Canadians, and the one party that recognizes the inherent intelligence, decency, compassion, and common sense of Canadians, to accept the truth, to face things, that are scary, and to say we can fix this together. We are not powerless. There is power in one, there is power in many, and there is power in our vote. And we exercise that power by voting green. We're speaking truth to power, and we're affecting change on the ground as surely as Tim did, and Bobby did, and Dalton did, to stop the Spadina Expressway. We can stop the ravages of climate change. We can stop feeding our kids garbage food, because it's popular, because the schools that are deprived of funding, this is one of the more vicious and pernicious ironies of our current culture. The schools are so desperate for funding that they'll do a deal with Coca-Cola to deliver sick food to schools so that kids get unhealthy, but the schools get some money. That's the sign of desperation in a provincial education system. All of these things can be fixed and they'll be fixed by elected people who aren't afraid to name them and speak that truth out loud. By coming here tonight, you've helped fund truth. You've helped fund Tim get to Queen's Park. You already helped me get to Ottawa, to the Parliament of Canada. Together, we will actually shift the direction of our society. We can steer a course to a sustainable world. I'm grateful like you wouldn't believe to see so many brilliant young people in the room tonight. I'm also grateful for all the gray hairs. Together, we're gonna rock this election. Thank you. Take a couple of questions. Yeah.